Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the grand final of the illustrious <coughs> football tournament that we run every year. Um, I won't take too much time, but I'll just give you an introduction about all, who's on what team, in case you haven't uh, actually experienced BP debating before, because there are a few new faces here. So at opening government, we have Beck and Stephen. Um, <laughs> at opening opposition, we have Kieran and Jackie. Closing government is Meredith and Viv. And closing opposition is Amit and Colette. Our adjudication panel is as uh, Tim Sonreich, Steph D'Souza, Linton Gunn, Mel Birch, and Julian Campbell. Um, and the motion for tonight is that this House believes that there should be strict, uh, strict limits on the level of media ownership by a single company. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to call on the Prime Minister to open tonight's debate. Mr Speaker, in a world which is so multidimensional and contains so many different elements which people must entertain in their daily existence and in all the decisions they make on all scales, we see media as a pivotal point in how people learn about the world around them and the distant world around them. We think that that's why it's imperative that when they know they're accessing a new source, they're accessing a competitive new source which actually involves things which actually present them with different opinions and opinions which actually can reflect and allow them to make choices. Currently we see media corporations and organisations such as Fox, owned by Rupert Murdoch, um, have the, under these corporations be owned be owning too many of the same forums of media. And we think that this see, when we see too many of these things owned by the same person, we see them generate a disproportionate amount of influence compared to what they should actually be having and holding over the people, the millions of people who read or view the sources of news which they are producing. And we think that we like already do have some of these restrictions in Australia, but what we'd like to actually propose is actually stop people such as Rupert Murdoch and stop other big corporations from owning more than one of the same type of media source in any given like forum and given country. <coughs> Um, so allow them, like for any share exceeding this, to actually be sold off so that these individuals can only have one TV channel. Oh, no. So that when you go on to the next TV channel, you know the opinion you're getting. If it's the same, it's the same for a reason. And if it's not, it, you can then make decisions based on the reasons these things differ. Um, I have several points to bring today about why we think that like, the current status quo reduces different voices in the media and why we think like, no change can occur unless we put in this system which will cover all sorts of sources. Because we think, firstly, that we think this reduces different voices in the media to a large extent. Because when people's main source of media is one type of media source due to like, the time limit they are able to put into consuming different media sources in one day, we see their ability to like, self-source like, different sorts of things in comparison to this as very limited. And we think that this means the most number of voices they're going to be able to get um, are going to come out like when they change TV channels or if they have time to maybe read two newspapers. So we think it's very important that these things are different and that these things come from different sources and not the same source of influence at, at one time. But why doesn't this occur currently under the status quo? We think the reason that people don't actually ever put in like the effort to make new sources actually like like valid and different if they should be different is because the reason is there's no restrictions. We think it is more valuable for Murdoch to own all like the TV stations or all of us like or a large number of them because we a large number of newspapers rather um, because we think that this reduces financial co competition and simply leads to more money. So we think that the profit incentive means these individuals will always try to own the greatest share they can. And we think that when news co competitions no thank you Amit, news competitions and things like that actually increases sorry increase news competition actually has Great, it like, reduces the influence of one source in particular, and it leads to better information by individuals being able to compete with different information sources. We think what will occur if we do this, and what's not occurring currently, is that people, um, um, no thank you, people will have to invest in more, more in their particular type of journalism, writing and things like that, because we think that when competitors are now able to enter the field, because they're not financially restricted from doing so, we think that they are better able to compete um, because, because there is more people that are pulling them up on things that they are perhaps doing wrong or not saying. And we think that this means that they in themselves have to produce better, more efficient, more accountable news. Because as people pull them up if they don't do it, and they think they have a better incentive to do it than right now. I'll take you, Kieran. If News Corp is producing journalism that is poor quality that people aren't reading, that's a pretty clear financial incentive to change those practices. Yeah, we think there's a difference, Kieran, between, between quality news... Which, 
the non-quality news which people aren't reading and which people are reading despite being poor quality. We think the average person doesn't have the ability to see that just because it's poorly written, we think the message that it can actually be putting in is the actual harmful part. We think that like poor quality aside, if everything's saying the same thing, that's what you're going to base your views on and that's how you're actually going to like form your views like where you vote at the next election and things like that which we'll get to later in our substantive. So secondly, I want to talk about like, why the very continue talking about why these very things are bad. We firstly think that this needs to stop. Um, the, the media, of all things, needs to be as open as possible because it's the way we look into businesses, it's the way we look into government media is the vision into those things that we don't actually have the ability to keep track of in other ways. And we think we're currently a, the, when corporations own too large a percentage, as they currently do, they're able to write a report in a way that most suits their editorial staff, their personal agendas, the shares they have companies in, the government they want to see elected. And we think that what this means is that if we only have one controlling it, there is a bias, and it will expand when all is over. So when Murdoch only publishes things in favour of like the Conservative governments, we think this is bad, as there is nothing to contradict it out there in the mainstream that people can actually sort of read, um, can, people can actually access. We think this is bad because it's not just the opinion you form and keep in your living room and keep to yourself. It's the way, as I just said, that you actually approach everything else in your life and the, the thing, frame, frames the view of which you take to, when you vote on things or where you purchase things and things like that. And we think that opinions outside of this are very hard for the average person who don't access other media sources. Is This is what they see as fact. Furthermore, we think homogeny in the news um, actually allows, like, um, people like Murdoch to act as they want. And we think that we've seen this really recently in like something like the phone telling scandal, because we think when there's any olig oligarchy that. like that, we think that there's like less competition, so there's less people looking out to make sure you're doing the right thing, and we think that you get perverse outcomes such as this, even beyond like the negative news in and of itself. Um, but why can't this change without reducing the share of media which is currently um, owned? But before I do closing. <laughs> What percentage of ownership would you allow a particular company to have yep. until your model would kick in? Well, our model would kick in like as like fast as possible, and what we would say is they're allowed one TV station, one newspaper, as we said in that model, like one of each type of media. So, um, and they can just sell the rest on the free market. So why, this can't, why can't we change this, like the actual problem of the status quo, without reducing the share of media? Why is there nothing else will work than actually reducing the share of media that people are allowed to have? First, let me say that what is currently happening is that you type all the revenue that can be generated to, fu to fund true news sources, because those with the greatest access to power and things like that have already got all the advertising and already got all that money behind them. So it allows them to, um, all that advertising is sourced and taken up by the major corporations. Um, such as Fox. And we think that even if other people try to enter these markets, and, or if, people, if individuals try to source um, news from other standards, um, their ability to do this is reduced in size by the large corporations which take out an unfair share of the media. We think that even though people we recognise are getting smarter and are getting more able to access the um, news through things like the internet or things like Twitter, those people who actually represent those views or actually propound those views are never going to be able to have the same ability to get them out there to the, to the masses, to contradict those big news corporation views if they continue to um, never receive a market share which allows them to actually get them beyond those forums which people have to look. And we think that these means that they are shut out and can't compete with those money. And we think that it means that really valuable news sources like Al Jazeera continue to struggle to survive and provide any debt because they don't actually have the, the monetary ability to actually be able to compete, to actually be able to get journals and do anything like that. So because we think our model gives you better news, better information so people can make better decisions in their own life, and better practices for news companies, we're very proud to propose. <laughs> I'd like to thank Beck for her speech and call on the opposition leader to open the case for the opposition. today, we believe in a free media ownership where there are no restrictions. We also believe in the existing mechanisms under the status quo that enforce stringent controls on these corporations. So things like having watchdogs, things like having liability for executives, and things like controlling defamatory messages. So I want to look at a couple of issues of rebuttal in my speech today. Firstly, this idea of a disproportionate level of influence over readers. 
So Beck said that these people, all these companies, would only be allowed to own one type of newspaper, whether that's Australian and not Herald Sun, not community newspapers. We think that people can still opt in to reading these particular newspapers to speak up. And we think that people make that active choice to read those newspapers when they actually go and pick which kind of newspaper they read. So people understand what kind of content they're getting when they're reading the Australian, what kind of content they're getting when they're reading the Herald Sun, and the type of news that exists in these types of newspapers. They want to talk also about this idea of it leading to uh, better information. But we say that, Mr. Speaker, people can still insist and find information on other sources. So they can go online to these blogs, they can go online to the internet and look at other resources and other sources of information if they wanted to find more, if they wanted to get that other type of information there. Then we have this idea that they want to talk about how accountability is important. Um, oh, I can't even do it more in books there. We think that's untrue, right? Because if the newspaper is exposed for lies and scandal and defamatory messages, like people aren't going to read that newspaper because they recognise that that newspaper isn't being accurate, that that newspaper doesn't provide that type of accurate, like the right information for them. People aren't going to choose um, that publication to go down that path there. And what we heard was the idea of like, there's nothing to contradict, to contradict to murder. We'd say that reading the age is a contradictory to like murder, right? We think that's a huge competitor there. We think that's one way people can do that. But then they're going to talk about the phone tapping scandal idea. But if you put aside how much ownership they actually have, we'd say that like News Corp got hammered for that, right? Like there was heaps and heaps of information and scandal put into the public media to show that, um, to make them liable to actually ensure that they weren't able to do that, ensure that they weren't going to get away with that. That was lots of exposure there. And then finally, this idea that they want to talk about how like, people representing views aren't able to contradict those big corporations because they don't have that, the financial resources that they are able to compete. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Right? Owning one type of media organisation, only one publication currently, doesn't equal to more revenue. We think that the best way you actually get better revenue in these newspapers, I'll take it a second actually, to support these newspapers is if the company is able to look after them, the company is able to have a share in that and better to weather the storm there. When Murdoch has all the revenue that makes news profitable, how can any other views compete unless they are particularly inflammatory or particularly just out of way? We think that the way they're able to compete is actually to exist because we don't think that smaller companies and smaller newspapers are ever going to actually exist if they aren't able to have support and funding of these big other companies. So, two points of substantive in my speech today. Firstly, the idea of the impact on the quality of journals and looking at the content and the readers. And secondly, the importance of the free media ownership principle. So, on the idea of the quality of journalism, we're looking at the moment at the landscape of where like, conventional <coughs> media is dying. No, thank you. Where like print media in particular, and particularly small newspapers are being shut down. So the Illinois Times okay. over in the US isn't able to survive because there's lack of readings. We think that's a harm in the kind of information that's produced when these newspapers are shut down. So we think it's really crucial for these large media conglomerates to actually control these sectors of the media in this particular climate that we're looking at. So a couple of reasons for that. The first is they have a large portfolio of holdings. So like big companies are more likely to run those small community newspapers successfully, like the leader, for example, because they get those cross promotional benefits, they recognise those cross cross promotional benefits, and they're able to capitalise on that, able to use that. We think that small companies are less able to get that media support and get that like they get the promotion of the media and justify that cost. And as I said before my rebuttal, that these media companies are able better to weather that storm if they start losing um, readers if they don't get that support there. Secondly, we think they're more capable of dealing with market trends. So things like where print is declining now, um, they can gain more revenue through TV, through online resources. We think they have a greater capacity because of more financial ability to invest in investigative journalism, journalism, for example, which is one particular area that is really lacking at the moment. And also, they're more or less likely, well, they're less likely to lay off staff. We think that keeping staff in these, in these corporations, the same kind of staff, is really important. No, thank you. So, second link inside you, the free media ownership merit. Jackie, do you think that this average Australian knows that Murdoch owns 70% of Australia's newspapers? Yeah, well, sure, right? People would think, understand what kind of newspapers they're reading. We think people know what, what like, the types of newspapers they're reading. So whether they read Larry Herald, like a typical Herald Sun reader, or like the age reader, or a person who reads the age. We think they're able to differentiate between the type of media and the type of people who own the corporations, who own these media, uh, like these media organisations. So, on to this idea of free media ownership. We'd say that the reason it's so principally justified, or like why free media exists in the first place, is that you ensure an awareness of the, like, the, the key facts that are influencing people's choices. So for example, that's influencing people's vote, 
voting or ensuring them like greater access to opinions that allow them to actually make better informed choices and make those um, ideas, get those ideas action. So we think that the free media ownership is particularly essential to achieving these aims and achieving these benefits. The first, one, the first reason for that is it means that the government isn't able to like control which messages predominate all the time. So it means that it's like exists as a fourth estate, as a proper platform. Or, like organisations separate to that government there. We think secondly, the free media market means that like commercial um, think commercial um, media are all like is able to dictate like what information is valuable there. And that's important for people in terms of making making choices. We think, for example, like the reason why the Herald Sun, the Age and the Australian circulate so heavily and circulate so widely is that people want to hear those opinions. People want to read those types of newspapers. We will go out there to seek that information. They actually want to know that content there. We think that's important. We think that's um, crucial for actually allowing them to exist and allowing those corporations to actually have their own say and not be influenced by the government. So we think this is fair gone. So that to ensure better quality of journalism, you need to have these big conglomerates owning these newspapers. It's without which they don't exist and they die off. We also we think we believe the free media ownership we think that's when you actually allow people to get those opinions out. We actually allow people to make those better informed choices. We're very happy to oppose. I'd like to thank Jackie for her speech and call on Stephen to continue the case for the opening government. In the same, <coughs> pardon me. In the same way that Jackie <coughs> wanted to convince us all that people have the active capacity to, cons to choose where and how they consume all of the news, we absolutely agree. We think that it is fundamentally intrinsically powerful to have that notion that people have the capacity to choose where they consume their news from. The biggest problem under the status quo is that massive media corporations who own 70% of the news organisations in Australia or huge amounts of the, news or, uh, of the news in America and the UK and other Western liberal democracies, the biggest problem is that they deprive people of access to that choice. They deprive people of the capacity to make an active choice about whether or not they choose to consume information from a new Murdoch news network, and I'm going to bring you more of that in my <coughs> substantive and my rebuttal, which I'm going to get onto right now. So the first thing we heard from Jackie was, and we heard about this in the in POI from Kieran as well in Beck's speech, was about the difference between defamation and bad news. We think, Mr. Speaker, aside from the fact that perhaps news organisations should aim for a slightly higher standard yeah. than that which they could be actively, like, criminally prosecuted for, we think, Mr. Speaker, that there's, you know, of course a prima facie case to suggest that people and news organisations can influence the news in manners that can't be directly criminally prosecuted. At the very, list, at the very least, Mr. Speaker, even if they aren't, you know, actively lying, they can give more column inches to stories that better support their point of view. They can even just choose to print things or air things or give things more time, or investigate particular things, or not investigate particular things more to the point, that don't actually cater to their point of view whatsoever. So that is it. So just because they can't be sued for defamation doesn't mean that they can't produce bad news. But then we heard from Jackie why people, that people can just opt in, and that if they don't opt in to what, like reading the Herald Sun, they can opt in to reading The Age. And I do read The Age, and I do consume information from a number of sources. But here's what we brought you at Beck that I think Jackie didn't really deal with. We said that other news organisations are restricted in their capacity to, uh, to voice other opinions because Fox and Murdoch and all of those <coughs> other big news corporations own all of the revenue sources. They own the readership, they own the advertising, they own all of the capacity for those smaller businesses to come up and suggest alternative news sources. So it means that even though you've got one news organisation that's giving you know, actual truth, that is going up against Murdoch, who is producing with his massive media shares all of the news that doesn't represent that fact. 
and it means that he owns all of the revenue that deprives those small media organisations of actually getting into the game whatsoever. We also heard in response to Beck's point about phone hacking that well they got away that like oh well obviously they've you know they've been prosecuted it's all fine they got away with that for decades Mr Speaker they got away with it they were probably still getting away with a whole bunch of practices and you know what Mr Speaker despite the fact that Jackie said that if they they got pulled up on that and now no one's reading their newspapers what other baloney like the Herald Sun and all of their editorial stuff being sued for defamation dozens of times and people are still reading the Herald Sun Mr Speaker just because people don't just because that kind of information is out there doesn't mean that it affects the fact that those particular media organisations have huge amounts of influence in a little bit of it. So, we talk. Now, sir. No. <laughs> Much later. <laughs> we also told you, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and was, what was brought up in Jackie's speech, is that these large media organisations will support all of the small community organisations. If that was altruistic, Mr. Speaker, why didn't they also do that under our model? If all of these ma massive media corporations just wanted to give money to small community newspapers, they can still do that. Write them bike checks and, a ma and massive amounts of money. The reason they want those newspapers, Mr. Speaker, is that it expands their influence, and it means that they have less competitors, and they have, um, in a second, they have less competitors and they have less incentives. To, uh, to compete because it means that they have much less competitors in that particular instance. We facilitate better news because it means that they, don't, that they can't just buy out that competition. Go for it. The existence of large media companies is not a barrier to entering the market of, of competitors. If I want to start a, comp a competitor company, I can do that. There's not a fixed amount of media right. you can put in it. Well, that's aside from Jackie saying that you're getting ever-diminishing readership, but here's the thing. Rupert Murdoch does have the absolute capacity to, to force other competitors out of the market. There is a huge barrier to entering new sources. Just because you can set up a blog doesn't mean that you can afford the huge amount of journalists and investigations and huge amounts of influence that it takes to... No, 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 no. <laughs> Enter the market doesn't mean that you can immediately afford all of those things, yeah. but you can approach revenue, or you can approach advertisers, you can approach all of those people who are currently being taken up by Murdoch. If Murdoch controls all of the newspapers and all of the advertisers go to Murdoch's newspapers, it means that if you want to set up a, it means that if you want to set up a newspaper, you have exponentially less capacity to attract those advertisers. So, Mr. Speaker, let's get on to some positive material. Firstly, democracy and government. We think, and as Beck flagged a little bit earlier in her speech, that. The biggest problem that we have with newspapers is that they have a disproportionate ability to affect politics. We don't think, Mr. Speaker, we want to exist in either case of the world, where we have either media organisations being overly critical or undercritical. We would say, Mr. Speaker, that the best thing that you can have is a wide variety of news a wide variety of news organisations providing a wide variety of alternative viewpoints that when it comes to consuming news, and that means that that is the best method of accountability. The media is often called the third arm of politics, and we think, Mr. Speaker, that it is massively yeah, thanks, Julian. We think that it is massively capable of holding the government to account and informing people about decisions alongside the government. And what we would much rather, Mr. Speaker, is rather than getting the Australian, which is active against one particular organisation, and, um, and like The Age, which is actively for another organisation, we would much rather, in addition to all of those, have a wide variety of news organisations and a wide variety of blogs and all of those other kind of media sources that act as an effective means of getting a wide variety of opinion. We think that the best way that you get the best government is that the government has to compete with all of those news organisations, and it means that the government has to actively be held by account to a, to a wide variety of newspapers and other sources. Now on to my second point which is about why it pushes other news organisations to the fringe. The biggest thing that's been accepted uh, in this debate is that it is very difficult for fledgling news organisations to either survive or enter the market in the first place. I think the biggest problem with that is that it forces those particular news organisations to head to the outer skirts of that media, to pick up particular media opinions that aren't being represented. We think the biggest problem is that that points to media extremism. We think the biggest reason that Fox has been able to capitalise in the United States is because it's been able to shoo into the very, very outskirts of what is considered rational, normal thought. We think, Mr. Speaker, that at the moment, that is the reality for news organisations. You can't compete in the middle, and you can't compete with all of those mainstream media sources. The only way that you can compete is to head to the very outer. And we think, Mr. Speaker, that that's worse for news overall. I think there should have been a clap in there somewhere. We think, Mr. Speaker, that because we get better news, and because we think that by opening up the market we get more competition, which allows for better news organisations and better accountability of government, and less of this fringe news reporting that we've seen in the recent past, we are very proud to propose. I'd like to thank Steve for his speech and call on Kieran to continue the case for the opening opposition.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is interesting that the nuanced response to our issue about investigative journalism, how we best achieve that from Steve, is that, well, blogs should just do it. Like, they should just do it, guys. Totally ignoring <laughs> the sources of revenue which are absolutely essential in a crumbling media market that allows big corporations to actually fund these projects. You need staff, you need resources, you need large amounts of technology. And that, in a fragmented market, is exactly what you lose when you have smaller companies that don't have the diverse revenue streams of a news corp to actually pursue these types of investigations. Can't have your cake and eat it too. So, Rabat, firstly, looking at the impact on the quality of journalism. What we first heard is that we need different viewpoints. Different viewpoints are the key. We just reject this idea that different viewpoints don't exist in the existing media market. The Age is extremely popular in Australia to counter the Herald Sun in the Australia. The Guardian is extremely popular in the UK to counter the Times, ladies and gentlemen. We believe that these sources exist and competitors are equally capable of, the, of entering the market if there's demand for these views, ladies and gentlemen. But then we had this presumption from them that their plan leads to different viewpoints that don't exist under the status quo. The problem is they totally missed the commercial realities of how the media market works. Because it's great to have your fringe you know, analysis of like lesbian green politics weekly or whatever, right? <laughs> but the problem is there just isn't a readership for that kind of market, right? So what happens is that these kind of fledgling newspapers with fledgling ideas that you want to create don't actually have enough of a market to sustain themselves. The reason a big media corporation can survive is even if they're leaking money on the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, they can get money through their TV stations, they can get money through online content that these small organizations simply don't get. So you don't necessarily get this plethora of different messages. What you will get is the same kind of viewpoints that are commercially viable, i.e. one or two tabloid newspapers, one major daily for the left, one major daily for the right. What a shock, that's exactly what we have right now. So, moving on, let's look at this idea of reflecting smaller views. Um, no, let's go back. Let's do this idea of defamation versus bad news. So they said, you know, well the problem is in the status quo, even if you have protections for defamation, you still get like bad news. And we didn't really know what bad news exactly meant. We reject the definition of bad news as simply being what lots of people want. We don't think people are stupid and just read the Herald Sun for kicks, even though they're like, you know, these messages are so infantile that they're not worth anything. We say that people are perfectly uh, are capable of making decisions to read newspapers that reinforce their own views. We're happy to justify that. We say if the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Australian is devoting too much, too many column inches to attacking the Gillard government. People wouldn't read that newspaper because they don't want to be exposed to those views they totally disagree with. The fact is they do because those are their views. And we're happy to have the media actually reflect that. So, moving on to this idea of better journalism, ladies and gentlemen. So, we brought you analysis of smaller newspapers. And I think Steve totally missed our point here. He thought we were talking about News Corp donating to smaller newspapers. That's not the point, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, organizations like News, Corp News Corp and Fairfax actually own these small regional newspapers and these small community newspapers. The reason for that is even though they can't make a huge amount of money from these from these resources, they can get cross-promotional opportunities through that ownership. They can, they can wear that kind of losses that they suffer through their other sources of profit. We say that a smaller organization simply can't sustain the same kind of contribution. Then also this idea of bad practices. So what we got from Steve is that News of the World got away with their terrible practices for decades. False. News of the World got shut down, ladies and gentlemen. We said that there's a pretty clear disincentive for terrible practices. Moreover, another important disincentive, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that someone like James Murdoch could be held criminally, li criminally liable for lying about what he knew about that situation. So senior executives are also held liable for major conduct. And here's the third point they also missed. There's also competitive pressures. Like the Guardian was absolutely loving the News Corp scandal, ladies and gentlemen, because that led to them being seen as having more integrity, more credibility. We say newspapers that practice those practices suffer. Finally, looking at this idea of forcing um, newspapers to the extremes, we think you're much more likely to be forced to the extremes in a fragmented market. If there's all these tiny newspapers buying for market share, the only way you get readership is by buying to the extreme, is by being the most controversial. We say major media ownership reduces that likelihood of mess. Kira, do you think that the Australian Press Council can adequately regulate media? Absolutely, absolutely. And that will lead me now to this idea of the issue of the capacity of consumers to make decisions, ladies and gentlemen. 
So, the key question here is what extent of knowledge do you need as a consumer in a media market to make a decision? We believe, ladies and gentlemen, that when people read the newspapers and see the views that are communicated, that's enough information. We don't think the actual owner of the newspaper is actually a crucial determining factor in their decision about the kind of content they read. But even if it is, even if it is crucial to know who the owner is of this actual newspaper, ladies and gentlemen, we see this incredibly clear awareness of ownership. You look at the Gillard government now slamming the Australian for being owned by News Corp, for being a pronounced bias across a range of newspapers, ladies and gentlemen, against the government. We say there's a huge amount of awareness about our ownership, ladies and gentlemen. Moreover, we think it's much better when you have major media organizations, right? Because when you have Rupert Murdoch owning a newspaper, it's incredibly obvious, even if you're a layman, that this is the kind of person who generally has conservative views. We say it's much harder in a fragmented market with, with you know, smaller newspaper owners that no one knows about. They don't know their background, they don't know their viewpoints, they don't know their commercial interests, ladies and gentlemen. We say if you're really so concerned about ownership, we're much more happy to concentrate that in a smaller group of individuals, ladies and gentlemen. So, furthermore, let's look this idea of accountability. Okay, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, accountability has been a problem for major organizations. We've looked at News Corp and we've agreed that behavior of the news of the world was unacceptable, ladies and gentlemen. However, we believe that big media is extremely accountable for its failures. So, let's look first at this example of News Corp. News of the world is a tiny proportion of News Corp's revenues, a tiny proportion. Yet, in the wake of the scandal affecting that newspaper, it had to be shut down, the Murdochs had to turn up to London to testify, there's a risk of criminal penalties and serious financial liability for the company as a whole. And that's because this accountability is sheeted home to the company itself. So these companies are still accountable even for their smaller entities. We say that's really, really significant. It doesn't happen with a smaller market. Moreover, there's, there's major factors, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of democratic accountability. Because we believe that the greater awareness you get through an entity like News Corp is really, really important. Finally, there's this issue of competitive pressures, ladies and gentlemen. Like, we recognize that the Herald Sun often runs dodgy stories. But the thing that's interesting about entities like the Herald Sun, the Australian, is every time they're accused of making something up, they go out of their way to slam that accusation. Because they know it's actually bad for their interest to be seen as lying about something. Not just in terms of defamation, but also because their integrity in communicating the news is undermined if those scandals hold up. We believe that these kind of uh, like bad practices and lies simply don't happen. If they do happen, we should have a more enforceable uh, media structure, ladies and gentlemen, which we're supporting. So at the end of this debate, the real harm is to the quality of journalism you get. Because smaller competitors doesn't lead to a proliferation of views and better, uh, and better arguments. We are proud to oppose. of media self-regulation under the Australian Press Council is sufficient. What we're going to bring to you today at Closing Government is why the status quo system of self-regulation as relates to the Press Council and as relates to what we've already heard from side opposition so far about the ability of people to effectively self-regulate what they're reading. We're going to show you today at Closing Government why that does not stand in today's debate, why that is ultimately a farce and why we need these kinds of strict media ownership laws so that people have a the kind of regulation that steps in because self-regulation is so ineffective in today's debate. But before I do, I'm going to do exactly what Kieran wants me to do and deal with what I think his big beef was so far in today's debate. And that is, ultimately, the idea that quality journalism will be decreased as a result of these kinds of strict regulations. And what we just heard from Kieran is that these kinds of moves where we ultimately encourage more players into the market are going to lead to extremes. He said that we're going to force extremes by having a fragmented market. And ladies and gentlemen, what we know is that more and more people join into a market, we have a plethora of opinions. And that can only be a good thing. 
I don't understand how under the status quo we're not forcing the extremes by not allowing multiple voices to exist in that market. We say that when there's not a moderate voice, when there aren't smaller parties who can get a buy-in, we only have what is a dominant perspective. And if that perspective is an extreme perspective, well then, bad luck for us. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not something we're willing to stand for in today's debate. But let's move right on to our extension, because this really is the crux of where the debate is at. Because our opposition today believe that the market functions effectively under the status quo. We heard from Jackie that the way things are supposed to work is that the media is supposed to function as a fourth estate between the people and between their government. That they're supposed to be a check on power, that they're supposed to create accountability in our democracy. And that's all very well in principle. But what does this look like in practice? Because what regulation actually exists on our media? And ladies and gentlemen, what we would say at closing government today is none. And if there's any, it's very little. And it's the kind of regulation that doesn't achieve anything to begin with. And the classic example of this is the press council. But before I do, let's take Kieran. So we're fine with more regulation. If your problem is with lax regulation, why don't you do that more stringently rather than strict ownership? We're not into, we can't support at the end of the day, it either, you either have more government regulation and you undermine freedom of the press, something that both parties in today's debate say they don't want to do because they believe in the importance of the media as a check on the power of governments. So either we have more regulation or we affect the ownership of mediaship laws. And ladies and gentlemen, given that we're all freedom of the press, we say that the media ownership laws are the way to go. But before we even do that, even if we were to assume that more regulation would fix this, we need to look at the fact that why the Australian Press Council is so toothless. And that's because it's a voluntary code. It's because it's not a legal or a legislative that, body, because it's a self-regulating body. It's because you can make complaints and the only thing that newspapers can do in response is print retractions. After the fact that that news has already been digested has been assumed as truth by the public. So that just doesn't fly. There isn't enough self-regulation in the market. But then let's deal with what we heard opening opposition, which is that ultimately it doesn't matter if our media isn't regulated, because you as consumers of the media can regulate yourself what you're reading and can discern the problems that exist in the media. And the example we had on this from Jackie ultimately was the phone hacking scandal. And we would say at closing government that the phone hacking scandal isn't an example of outrage at um, high media, at um, these kind, kinds of media ownership laws. Ultimately, that's a scandal of the unethical practice of those journalists. And we would say that the problem of cross-media ownership only yeah. came into the public eye as a result of a focus on that unethical practice. But these problems have been persisting for years and that there are more underlying problems at play here that need to be resolved through this model. But why is it that people cannot discern and cannot self-regulate this market in terms of what they're reading? We heard from opening opposition that no, people, people know. People know that Rupert Murdoch owns Fox and that he owns the Financial Review and the Australian and Herald Sun. And ladies and gentlemen, we just don't buy that. We don't think the majority of people do know. We think that papers look different. We think they have different brand names. They have different writers writing for them. They look different. And why? Because they're supposed to engender in people the premise that they are different news sources. They say things like exclusive of the Herald Sun, exclusive of Today Tonight, where they don't actually say, no, we've been working with our colleagues here at the Financial Review because we got a memo from Murdoch that ultimately he wants us to say this, that we know we're in the pockets of the Blair government and we can say this right now. So ladies and gentlemen, we just don't accept in today's debate that people ultimately can comprehend the kind of media concentration that exists under the status quo. We don't think people comprehend that bias, and I'll take you now and Yeah, your opening said that the Murdoch press was breaking the law and phone tapping for decades. Do you still stand by that statement? We agree, absolutely, but we don't think that the a response in the public outrage to this scandal has anything to do with the kinds of concentration of media ownership that exists in this country. This is a response about journalism poor practice. This is a response about unethical okay. conduct. Yes, it's exposed a problem that exists in terms of concentration, but ultimately we don't think that most people appreciate the problems because they assume that these brands are different, because they don't realise that they're owned by the number one organisation. So ladies and gentlemen, what happens 
happens under the government model today. Effectively what happens is when you can only own one type of newspaper, one television channel, one radio station, you know when you flip channels, you know when you change publications that you're reading a different kind of news. So we think our model of strict media ownership ultimately reinforces what are fair assumptions in consumer practice that ultimately should be backed in today's debate. Ladies and gentlemen, because the media cannot self-regulate effectively and because we don't think people should be expected to equip themselves with this kind of knowledge, because we don't think that it's unreasonable to accept what is the status quo situation, ultimately it's on our, it's the emphasis is on us to push these kinds of strict media ownership laws. Thank you. I'd like to thank Viv for a speech and call on to open the case for the closing conversation. How has the government described the Murdoch press and the types of people they're trying to regulate? They've described them as using their current media ownership any way they can to ensure they have influence over the political process and they have power and control over the market. They've described them as functionally evil and willing to secretly break the law for decades, in Stephen's words. And I asked Vivian well, and she conceded, they're willing to break the law for decades. Not once has the government bench been willing to ask, how will these kinds of corporations react to this new form of regulation? They've assumed they will blindly follow on. We're going to show you what closing opposition is. They probably won't. They'll find a way around it. But the reason it's going to be so much worse is because it's going to be impossible for us to see. Right now, under the status quo, you can point to a newspaper and say that it's cross-owned by the Murdoch press. That's why they're taking it easy on the news of the world. And people did that to other newspapers owned by Murdoch. Under the world created by the government, you will not be able to do that. Accountability is lost. Before I get there, some rebuttal. Firstly, media domination. What we heard from the government was what we get under the status quo is media domination you don't control ownership. We don't agree. We think that you get diversity right now. For every Fox and MSNBC, for every Murdoch Press newspaper, there's a Guardian, Le Monde, De Spiegel, and people who are interested in looking for those things can see. We also think that like jurisdictions can work around this, right? With things like disclosure regulations. Anytime a news story on MSNBC comments on a company that is owned by the owners of MSNBC, like, I don't know, Shine Hard Wigs, spilling <laughs> chemicals into a river. That's obviously a fake example. They, they have to disclose that, right? The fancy, nice looking reporters have to say, full disclosure, this is owned by our parent corporation, right? That is the biggest benefit of the status quo. But when they don't have to say that because it's not owned by their parent corporation, but it still functionally is, that's the harm that they get. We also think that even if they thought that media domination existed now, their proposal won't fix it. No, thank you. Why? People aren't going to magically shift the newspapers that they consume from, and if they do, they will shift to the closest thing to what they were reading. What they hope is if Murdoch Press shuts down The Australian, everyone reading The Herald site is all of a sudden going to go, very good, I'll consume balanced media now, because now the marketplace has been fixed. We disagree. They will shift to the closest thing to what they had, and we don't think, number one, that ensures more balance, and number two, that that allows new players to come in. All it will do is inflate the Herald Sun's readership astronomically. And if you're worried about a multiplicity of opinions, there is a difference between the Herald Sun and the Australian. There is no difference between the Herald Sun and the Herald Sun. We think that is a significant loss. Competitors can exist now. If I had good content, I could create any kind of media source, and anybody who wanted to would advertise in me if people wanted to read my stuff. It's not that people have to read Murdoch Press, it's that they do, and that won't change. People aren't just going to magically change. We think what is going to happen under their model is exactly what they said, that, that the Murdoch Press is going to dump the Australian, right? So number one, the Herald Sun will still endorse all of the views that you're worried about the Australian endorsing if they are controlled by the Murdoch family. There still won't be a, a like, pluralistic source of information, but you lose a source of journalism. In fact, as depressing as it is, the Australian is probably the best mainstream source of actual investigative journalism in Australia, but because they sometimes earn things that you consider the same political background as the Herald Sun by virtue of their similar ownership, then you've got to lose a whole media source because they're going to dump the less profitable one, which is, in this case, the Australian. The second point of rebuttal, the failure of self-regulation, the extension of the closing government. Number one, we think that self-regulation isn't actually as ineffective as they say. The press council is vigorously trying to enforce these things, and it's true that it's toothless, but we think that there's a lot of self-compliance. 
Why is there a lot of self-compliance? Because people don't want government regulations on their media content because they think it would be much worse than what their self-regulation would do. But if your biggest problem is regulating the content, then you can absolutely do that without limiting content, like the ownership of whole newspapers, right? So in the United States, you must disclose if the story that you're doing affects a like, owner of your organization as well. Like MSNBC has to comment on a news story concerning a corporation that is joint owned or partially owned by the corporation that owns MSNBC. Those regulations exist. They can absolutely exist. No, thank you. We don't need content control. Second, sorry, third and final point of rebuttal, media diversity. The government model actually loses diverse media in the media landscape in a moment, Viv. Why? It's still really costly to enter the media landscape, right? It's still really costly to run a newspaper. There's still dominant players. And in fact, as they pointed out, if Fox is the most popular thing right now, right? If Fox is the most popular TV, like news TV cable thing that Murdoch Press owns, then what are they going to dump? Not Fox, everything else they have to to keep that. And so you're just going to consolidate all of the viewings on Fox because you've got to find the nearest thing to what you can to watch. What that means is there's still dominant players, it's still too costly to enter, and so you're not actually going to get like a pluralism. You're just going to get less like less players in there. And to the extent that the Australian and the Herald Sun are the same, they're not so similar that losing one isn't a loss of journalism. Viv. And then you stated that if people want to find out about concentration of the media, they can read about it in other publications like Le Mans. For the non-media watch viewers out there and the majority of the Australian public, do you really think that they even realise, let alone act on these kinds of concerns? Two things. Number one, your whole case relies on people consuming multiple forms of media or else why would they ever switch to the age if you shut down the Australia? They won't. They'll find the closest thing to their politics, which is the Herald Sun, and you won't fix anything. But secondly, the point is not that individuals will seek out the hidden, like, like, regulated corporate ownings of these companies. And this leads me to my extension about the importance of visible ownership. The point is, anyone else can. So who? Your competitors. Your competitors can point out if this particular newspaper is owned by the same group of companies as this particular newspaper, and if they're taking it particularly easy on this. Same thing with multiple companies, right? You can tell if the Murdoch Press newspaper is taking it easy on anything else, or any political party that has an affiliation with Rupert Murdoch, right? Because you can tell it just by looking at the corporate books. You can go to the stock exchange and see that information. What's going to change under their model? Well, we think that these newspapers are still going to hold on to power. How? I thought of four ways to the bench. One, secret holdings by changing names and using things like spouses. Two, using dummy corporations set up either exclusively to run the paper or to run up all your other holdings so that they can't be traced back to the same person. No, thank you. Um, three, partial ownership. I asked Beth a point of information about this. I said, what is your definition of ownership? And she just didn't give a clear answer to that. So if it is allowed under their model and you can own 49%, they absolutely will own 49%, but they won't have to report that they own that newspaper because they don't. Fourth is third-party content creation, like fake blogs, right? Gagel in Damascus was an absolute fake and no one knew it until she came forward. How on earth are you meant to regulate the content that's created on the internet if it's there to rubbish a certain political candidate and it happens to be mentioned by the Murdoch press that you can't regulate where that came from? But they don't need to do these things right now. That's the beauty of the status quo, right? You don't need to create all these, like, or fake things that I happen to think of, right? Because there's no rule preventing you from owning multiple things, and so you don't have to do things that are functionally illegal. But also, there are benefits to say, we own multiple papers, advertise with us, and you'll have that ad space. Under their model, we don't know who owns what. Consumers can't factor that in. Media Watch or another third-party organisation can't dig through and present that information to people, right? Competitors can't dig through and find out that you're being soft on another Murdoch paper because you are a Murdoch paper. For a side that wants pluralist media and an informed public, what they're doing is taking what we agree is a super important thing, which is the media as a source of information and limiting what we can know about that source of information. We think that these kinds of corporations are always going to be a step ahead of regulators, and because of that, the motion should fall. about transparency and visible ownership. 
Secondly, ask which policy best allows the media to function as a fourth state. And then finally, look at the capacity of consumers to actually make accurate decisions. So firstly, on transparency and feasible ownership, we heard three things from a myth. Firstly, that under the status quo, competitors have the ability to point out when there's bias reporting. We would say that even if that's true, that requires consumers to have read both those newspapers. Even if you, like, the age points out that the Australian has done things like yeah. false climate reporting, you need to have read that alternate media source yeah. to be able to do so. And the problem is under the status quo, the age doesn't even do so. It's smaller media uh, organisations like Crikey, who are going along their power blog series, <laughs> actually going along and reporting this. And very few people seek out that type of alternate media. Secondly, he said, there is a risk that people will abuse this system. They'll set up dummy corporations or they'll do things like have partial ownership. We would say that's not a reason to not implement this model. That just means you need a more effective legislative system. This has worked effectively in other cases. Finally, he said, well, actually, there's a risk people will just go to other sources. They'll set up fake blogs and seek to slander individuals in that way. We would say we're never going to have the capacity to control the internet and control things like fake blogs for the reason why yeah. newspapers are different. The reason why Murdoch is different, Mr Speaker, is firstly because of the scale. The number of people they reach is differently. And secondly, it's an element of trustworthiness. When you pick up a newspaper, you assume yeah. what you're reading is going to be true and it's going to be trustworthy. Very few people assume that about the internet. So, no thank you. Which policy best allows the media to function as a fourth estate of it? Every single episode of corporate malfeasance in the history of the world shows that corporations are always a step ahead of regulators in bypassing rules. Why won't they be for your model too? Alright, firstly we think we do have the capacity to effectively regulate because people have to register as a corporation to see who they are and who they have affiliations with. But even if some people are able to bypass the model, I think on the whole, this is better. We don't think that just because there could be some people who are able to skirt around, this isn't the reason to implement this. So. Which policy best allows the media to function as a fourth estate? What we heard from Jackie is that we actually need a multitude of views to exist under the status quo, and we can't allow government to control who can criticise it and who can hold media earnings. We would say, firstly, that's an absolute assertion that you get a multitude of views under the status quo. Because what you get in Australia, Mr Speaker, is you get News Corp or you get Fair, fair Facts. And they said, well, people can just read Le Mans, you know, like, they can go and look at smaller media. We would say, fundamentally, a very small people have knowledge of those sources and have to have the ability to access those, because it costs more money, or you have to subscribe to these kinds of sources. Not everybody can afford to subscribe to Crikey. You have to be somebody who actively seeks this out and are interested in this type of media. We would also say, secondly, these types of groups are struggling under the status quo. People like Crikey and New Matilda just can't get enough money to get off the ground. You can't rely on those sources yeah. to continue to exist. Then Jackie said, well, this is actually about the local leader and your community newspaper. We would say, firstly, you have community news, and that's different. But secondly, it's a problem when you are saying that small newspapers can only exist with the backing of large ones. If you want a multitude of views, you want those papers to exist, that's actually a harm. No, thank you. But the real question is whether or not this functions effectively now, Mr. Speaker. We would say that the media doesn't, no, thank you, effectively function as a fourth estate. When, Blair, when Tony Blair is considered the fourth, sorry, when Rupert Murdoch is considered the fourth member of the Murdoch government. <laughs> <laughs> Too many names. They have the ability to shut down investigations that are seeking to shut down Murdoch newspapers. That is a problem when they're, oh, they're reporting. So thank you. Has the ability to carry over political bias. What well, we have from Kieran is we actually need account the accountability exists under the status quo. We would say that fundamentally overestimates the power of companies and people like Murdoch. He said that criminal proceedings occur under the status quo. We would say that the photographic example that he wanted to use, criminal proceedings exist at the last moment when there's a public outcry over the phone tapping of a small girl. We would say there was evidence of police cover-up by the Scotland Yard. They were complicit in things like phone hacking. They actively covered up evidence of it occurring. <coughs> you can't rely on that type of accountability. But secondly, we don't think politicians have that incentive. And I've already given you the example of Blair. So, lastly, what we heard from Karen is this actually pushes people to the extremes. We would say that firstly, extremism can actually serve to limit your market Wait share. When you're seeking to attract to the majority, we don't think far out extremist yeah. reporting does anything yeah. to give you a short term yeah. gain. Secondly, we would say, even if it drives people to the extreme, it gives people a better ability to interpret. You know for certain when you pick up a different newspaper or you turn on a different station that is published by different people and you know where to get different Find opinions that. when Wait you that. don't understand this quote, no thank you. What I want to do finally is ask, where do we actually, or how do we give uh, the capacity of consumers to make better decisions? What we heard 
firstly, was that people actually have an ability under the status quo to interpret and understand different sources. An example that we heard was Gillard calling out the Australian for having a bias. Well, we would say, firstly, this is only to happen in the light of the hacking scandal and inquiry into Australian news. But secondly, what that is, is only an inquiry into one field. It does nothing to deal with the type of bias we see in uh, media reporting, in TV and radio. Finally, what he said was actually a fragmented market is worth it. We say no because it gives people certainty. What we told you in our extension, Mr. Speaker, is that the status quo has failed. Yeah. Self-regulation hasn't actually been effective. That the press council, with their voluntary code, only does things in a reactive way. It retracts after the harm has been done. Once that what lie is, is out there, that false climate change reporting is out there, very few people read those retractions, and that harm yeah. is there. That harm exists. And it said, well. It just isn't a problem because uh, people don't want the government involved. If that was true, Mick, we wouldn't be having this debate. If self-regulation worked yeah. and people and that incentive existed, we wouldn't be having this debate. <coughs> it's never stopped anyone from printing lies before. We'd say that we, the way you deal with this is you don't limit what people have the ability to print and what people consume. You just don't give them the ability to own 70% of the media so people only get exposed to that one source. We told you in our extension that these individuals don't have the capacity to self-regulate because all these sources look different. We have different news readers, different stories, you have exclusives. You don't always have that ability to discern. When a majority of people can't understand that source, that is a problem, Mr. Speaker. When you can't verify the validity of those facts, that's an issue. When you have bad climate change reporting, it relies on people to do things like read different sources and understand the facts. That's an issue. And they just said, well, people will just go to a different newspaper. I told you in my introduction, that's not a problem. You can read whatever you like, but as long as you know the bias of that and exactly where it's come from, that's the issue. Mr. Speaker, there is a problem under the status quo. And the only way to fix it is to make a remove the deficiency, deficiencies that currently exist with industry and with individuals. Thank you. Of complacence, the quality of media that's out there, and we want to help skepticism all the time. 
firmly and binding on this point. We heard consistently from Mezendiv that the power of Murdoch is bad, and we want to change that. They don't change that through the, through the model or the extension that we got from that side of the house. He'll still be rich and he'll still be powerful and he'll still have the most dominant media sources, but you just don't keep him accountable on your side of the house. It's just easier to have dummy companies and easier to have like fake blogs. And importantly, the regulation that they wanted at closing government does absolutely nothing. We're happy for regulation to exist on like content rules and things like that. We're just not having to limit ownership because that's bad for accountability. No. Second thing, effect and competition. Our extension is pretty clear. It's that small organisations and other organisations have a role in attacking the sphere of influence that these large companies have. And you undermine that on your side of the house. So we heard across that bench that there are barriers to entering the market because size and capital means that large media companies just dominate. Firstly, as I pointed out in the point of information, these barriers don't exist in the way they think they operate. So for example, the fact that Al Jazeera is so successful in its target market points to the fact there is a market for these different kinds of point of views and quality media. But importantly, they're not going to be able to like, compete with the audience that Fox has in such a different market. No, thank you. But when these barriers, the, the, the fact that these barriers, the, where the barriers do exist is financial. And like, the, if, you need, if you want capital to start a niche or specialised news source, you need to be a big conglomerate, you need to be a big company because it's a risky venture. So you don't change that on your side of the house. You don't give them cash. You don't inject cash into their pockets, Mr. Speaker, because you don't actually achieve what you want to at, at opening government. I think that was a pretty big failure on that side of the house. But finally, on advertising capital on this point. We heard that big companies suck up advertising capital and that is bad. Okay, two things. Either, if it's true that the most extreme and the most salacious forms of media are the best and the most financially attractive, that means the advertising will still flood there and they're still going to be owned by the sources. But if that's not true and a whole variety of media sources are actually attracted to the populace, we think there is space for these com companies to enter the market and there is space for the advertising dollars to go there. Okay. When you hand over your three dollars at the news agent for a paper, exactly what tells you that the Herald Sun and the Australian are owned by the same person? The headline on one of those newspapers that says, hey, these co companies or th these newspapers are owned by the same guy because the Australian and the Age and the Herald Sun and a whole and the Guardian they're not all owned by one person yeah, yeah. because there is a market and there are competitors. It isn't one owner, and the fact that there are more than one owners, Mr. Speaker, points to the fact that they attack their competition. No, thank you. So maybe this final thing: the effect on the quality of media. So what we told you at closing opposition, this is really important is if you want quality media out there, if you want quality media in the public domain, you need transparency and you need it now, and you need it all the time, Correct. Mr. Speaker. That's the most important thing in this debate, accountability. So, the gut told us across the bench is that you need a variety of viewpoints and regulation is better. Firstly, if the closing government wants regulations on content disclosures, then regulate on content disclosure, Mr. Speaker. We're fine with that. This side isn't against regulation empirically. We're not against it as an idea. What we are against is limits on ownership, and that's incredibly important. We don't think it actually hurts a multiplicity of views out there. Because what do you do? Who, which news outlet, what kind of sources do you dump if you have to reduce your ownership in the media? What do you do? You dump things that are specialised local content, Mr. Speaker, that are slightly worse media owners than, for instance, Fox, because the Fox uh, generates more profit. We think because of economies of scale, these large media outlets are actually quite good for some things. For example, international content, local specialised content, that's really important, Mr. Speaker. So on quality of media, you think we get quality of media under our status quo, but you don't get the quality of media, media out there when the populace and regulators, Mr. Speaker, and alternative co and competitors can actually po can't point out the sorts of sphere of influence that a particular company has. The reality is, Amit and I know how easy it is to set up a company, how easy it is to like post a blog, fake blogs. In the small amount of our law degrees that we pay attention, we work out, it's not that hard. The reality is, big conglomerate companies are smarter than us and they will stay ahead of regulators. We need transparency. They don't have to do those things at the moment, but they will under your model with motion calls. <laughs> as the ads call, uh, call panel leave, I'd like to invite everyone to give the debaters another round of applause for